Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, we are here to do a panel about mentorship programs in open source. Uh, my name is Maria Cruz. I'm a program manager in the Google Open Source Programs Office, and uh, we'll do introductions. Hi, I'm Stephanie Taylor. That's loud. I'm Stephanie Taylor, and I am the program lead for the Google Summer of Code program. Are we introducing our programs also now? Oh, it's okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I forgot the notes. Um, yes, so if you're not familiar with Summer of Code, it is for new contributors coming into open source. And again, we're talking about all mentorship programs today. Uh, hi, I'm Abby Kubunak Mays. I lead GitHub's open source maintainer programs, where we really focus on the people behind open source, so the maintainers. So that's why I care a lot about mentorship. I think that works really well. So I'll be talking a bit about what we do at GitHub, but also um, when I was at Mozilla, I ran Mozilla Open Leaders. So I think that fits a bit better with this mentorship program. And um, just to distinguish between the different programs with Open Leaders, I was inspired both by like social movements, so just seeing how people are able to grow these movements through mentorship. And I wanted to be in a place where we had people advocating for open source who knew how to do open source and could teach others to do the same. Um, but also, um, also inspired by uh, accelerators. So my husband was running a startup accelerator at the same time. So we ended with this 12-week program where students learn the basics of open source. They bring their own project. And then we invite them to return and teach others. And that way we're able to scale exponentially and uh, change the world. OK. <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen Sandler. I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, I have a heart condition, and I have an implanted pacemaker defibrillator that uh, inappropriately shocked me when I was pregnant because my heart was doing what a normal pregnant woman's heart does. I got really passionate about software freedom and that, um, and, and, and all of its, its, its nature. And it stands for the proposition that our technology may not be made for us, and what will we do when it fails? Um, and part of that is that our technology will not be made for everyone unless it's made by everyone. And so um, given the homogeneous nature of the creation of our technology, we realized we needed to create a program to encourage um, people who have been generally excluded from that creation and to help mentor them so that they become a part of our community. So um, we established a program called Outreachy, which is paid remote internships. They take place twice per year, um, and we place people with it. It was inspired by Google Summer of Code. Um, and we'll talk more about that program along with all the others. Yep. Hello, uh, my name is Hong Phuc Tang, representing Force Asia. Um, we promote the adoption and development of open source in Asia. One of our main goals is to increase the number of ASEAN contributors into the open source ecosystem. And uh, to achieve this, we have been um, a proud mental organization uh, under Google Summer of Code and also Code In for many years. Um, learning a lot from uh, Google Summer Code, back in 2016, we started our own initiative that called Code Heat. And this initiative also um, tried to help young developers and students um, to learn on a real life project and uh, while contributing to open source. So the main focus of this initiative is to um, um, focus on effective Git workflow. So basically, people learn to break big problems into smaller tasks, and they learn how to make PRs in a way that is easy for reviewers. So we also promote like peer, um, peer reviews, and then um, how people can uh, write a clear commit message. So basically, to prepare this developer for a more collaborative and scalable environment um, for their future work. And I will talk more about this later today. Wonderful. So we have um, created a few questions to walk through how to design a mentorship program. Uh, and any questions you have, uh, we can address at the end, or maybe if it's relevant in the middle, we can also do that. So uh, to start with, what impact were you seeking when you started your mentorship program? And related to that, what goals did you establish for your program in the design phase? And maybe we can also clarify who is the program designed for? Uh, okay, so it's going to have the matter what I guess the first. So, so our main uh, goal was always to um, to foster a new generation of open source contributors. So we know that uh, we we always need new people. We we always need the developers. Are always needed everywhere in in, in different projects. So that is our. Um, um, 
primary goals. And um, for for this particular um, initiative that I mentioned about code heat, basically the our main target is the um, uh, computer science students and um, early young uh, like entry level developers um, early on of, of their career and focus a lot on Asia, um, Asia, Asian, um, yeah, Asian countries. Um, yeah, so um, what we try to do is to get as many as people as possible to solve some DeFi um, GitHub issues on real open source projects and um, the outcome so, uh, so of, of the project at the end of, of every uh, every year program, we try to, to, to understand how much contribution that we get from from this um, uh, journey and um, how the number of people if it's like continue to increase over a period of time. Outreachy was originally designed as a program for women um, based on the complete lack of women involved in the free and open source software communities. And as we progressed with the program, we increased to gender diversity. And as we um, continued over the years, we realized that there were other groups that were being excluded that we really should create opportunities for. And similarly, just a membership of a particular group didn't mean that you had experienced the obstacles towards your contribution. So over time, we've adjusted the program, and now the program is open to anyone who is subject to systemic bias or who is impacted by underrepresentation. And we ask people, um, the applicants, to tell us about the discrimination that they themselves have experienced. Um, and it's been a really effective way of, um, of changing the program so that the people who need the opportunities the most are able to get it. Um, so that's sort of the, um, the, the bench of our program. Um, we've had about, um, we've had over a thousand people come through our program already. It's a really global program. So um, there was one round where we had um, at least one participant from every habitable continent. So um, we're all over the world. Um, in uh, some of the recent rounds, we've had a very large participation in Africa. Um, it's really been exciting to see how the program has evolved. And um, you know, we pretty much changed something about fundamental about the design of our something. We tweak something about our program in every round as we get feedback about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and uh, I think we'll keep changing as the, as the years come. Yeah, and I know I described my program a little bit more in depth at the beginning. Uh, so just real quick, um, Mozilla Open Leaders, that actually started with scientists in mind. So it was designed to help scientists sort of do this boot camp and learning how to do open source. And it really expanded over time uh, to be just anyone who wanted to do open source. We want to help you do that. We want to mentor you through that. So with Google Summer Code, the whole idea is to bring new contributors into open source communities. And this is our 20th year of the program. We have a session right after this that you can learn more about Summer of Code and Outreachy, actually. But one of the things that for many years, for 17 years, the program was only open for students. So those 18 years and older. And then we decided to actually expand it. So now it's open to students and to beginners to open source software development. And so that change, what that really has changed is that now you have kind of early career professionals. So people maybe post university, those changing careers, coming back from leaves. And it really has opened up the kind of the breadth of availability for a lot of people who are like, oh, I can't do that because I'm not a student anymore. But this is where we need everybody's help to let us help spread the word that it's not just students because for 17 years it was. So kind of word is out there about that. So it's hard to change people's minds about that. But yeah, that's what we're pretty much all about. Yeah, you keep that. Um, <laughs> Related to the to the original question of goals, and we can revisit that if you didn't feel like you answered that, uh, we're going to talk about impact. So how um, how did you measure the impact of, of the mentorship? Uh, did your evaluation strategy change from the design phase of the program to the implementation? Um, was there any unexpected impact that you decided to capture for your program? Yeah, I can start that. We're, we're going this way just to warn you. <laughs> well, actually, just in terms of impact of GSOC, I was a mentor with GSOC like over a decade ago. And I actually, at one of the mentor summits, Stephanie doesn't know I'm going to say this. I remember being there, and she went and found me the woman t-shirt sizes. <laughs> and I just felt so included. And I think that really shaped like my career in open source afterwards. So thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, round of applause for Stephanie. Um, 
But in terms of impact for Mozilla Open Leaders especially, I was really focusing on that movement building aspect. So I wanted to optimize for the people that were going through the program that were able to multiply themselves. So they were ready to mentor others and have them become open leaders and like teach others the same. Because if you think of an MLM, like that's how you scale exponentially rather than just teaching a course. And I'd be able to reach a lot more people at once by doing an open source 101 course, but I really wanted this like hearts and minds change so that people were excited about open source and wanted to keep doing that. So what I measured really and what I optimized for was the retention rate. So how many people were going through the program and were so excited that they came back and mentored others and they wanted to multiply themselves. So I designed a lot around that, but that's like definitely a longer term thing to measure. So for more immediate, we actually saw a huge increase in GitHub activity in the projects that we were mentoring. So the first round that I ran, I was the person mentoring all 20 projects. And we had this hackathon at the end as like this hands-on experience of actually working open. And we had seven-fold activity on GitHub compared to the projects that weren't mentored. So I think it just showed the, that just applying a few simple best practices in open source can really just increase that engagement. So that's what I think convinced me to keep doing this and then me to um, yeah really think about this impact more broadly yeah I mean the same here I think uh, in, in, in a lot of ways we've uh, you know uh, we um, uh, originally started as a program for GNOME so we only had like six interns for GNOME and people got so excited about the program that we wound up engaging quite a lot of volunteers and, um, and expanded the program very organically to other communities until it became dozens and dozens of communities that were participating instead of just GNOME and it became a, a whole project unto itself, which was really exciting. And seeing the mentors um, come out from our graduates, from our alums has been amazing. We had one intern early in one of the early rounds who became a mentor, whose mentee became a mentor, whose mentee became a mentor. And now that original intern is a great, is a great, great <laughs> grand mentor. So it's been really exciting. I think like in every round that we have more past interns become mentors or org admins. In the last round, I think we had, um, I think 13 former interns were mentors. So um, that's uh, generally like increasing and it's very exciting. Um, you know, I think most of the major changes that we've made and, uh, and, and also with the staffing has come from the people within our, um, our alumni base. Um, and so this multiplier effect is I think one of the most exciting and powerful things. But then we also see things that I think are important for mentorship of seeing, um, uh, sorry, impact of the program of seeing um, graduates of our program become on the boards of, um, of the free and open source software you know, foundations, um, winning awards, and generally, um, you know, one of our uh, graduates founded a new mentorship program themselves. Um, and then three other communities were established that, that were like um, generally women in tech or um, open source collaboration communities in different countries from the people who came through our program. And so if you're doing your program right and people are getting the experiences, they wanna share that with other people and it's really exciting. Yeah, so um, we have having similar experience in uh, how to measure impact, um, like what Abby and Karen already mentioned before, quantitative uh, measurement, like the number of contribution and retention rate. We also um, like focus a little bit more on quantitative uh, approach where we gather feedback from the mentees and mentors uh, to, 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 to get their opinions, how they feel about the program. And another thing as um, like add on to what Karen said, we also look into the career progression of the participants. So for us in Asia, so when people participate in a program or contribute to open source, it's really important for them to build up their portfolio in order to land a good job in the future. So I met a few people here where they used to be um, our participants and either G-Stock or Codehead, and now they're working at Twitter um, at X or, or, or at Google or, or Microsoft. So um, I think this is a very good uh, example and um, a, a model to share with our community. Wonderful. Um, do we have any more thoughts or ideas we want to share about the multiplier effect of mentorship programs? Or do we feel, because some of you have responded, but okay, Steph. Sure. All right. Um, since Google Summer of Code has been around for 20 years, there have been quite a few programs that have been modeled on it in some way. And there are a lot of programs that are actually, I remember years ago, the um, 
Oman, Oman government actually did a summer of code. So we have governments that are actually modeling after summer of code. And many companies have tried it over the years. Doing mentorship programs is hard, as all of us up here can tell you. And so sometimes the companies do it for a year, and then that's it. Um, and that's still okay. They tried. But there are also a lot of universities that do similar programs for open source mentorship. There are research projects. So there are a lot of different ways that the, all of these mentorship programs have influenced people. And I think to kind of everyone's point here is that like after Google Summer of Code, so many people go on to become mentors themselves. They go on to create their own open source projects. At least four projects this year that we accepted are projects that were started by people who were GSOC students previously. So when they do their application, they say, oh, I was a GSOC student in 2016. I'm like, okay, you're, you're going to get a little bump up there. You're going to get a little, you got a little cred. So it really is pretty awesome to be able to meet people when we're at different conferences. We just did a big meetup in Munich, and we got to meet so many people that have been part of the program as mentors, contributors, and both. Um, from 2008, we had a guy wearing his 2008 Google Summer of Code t-shirt. So yes, and he's still a mentor to this day. So we've had mentors that have been doing it for 15 plus years. So it clearly, mentorship means a lot to the people that are mentees but it also means a lot to the mentors themselves. It's incredibly rewarding, and I think that's why a lot of the mentees go on to become mentors themselves, because the mentorship they received was so life-changing for them that they want to give back and help others have that experience and be a part of their community. Because also, it's all about bringing people into the open source community, but it's also so individualized, and having a mentor that cares and understands exactly what they went through is so special, I think, for these mentor mentees. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add one small thing on the multiplier effect. Um, one of the things I'm actually really proud of um, at Mozilla before I left when we were spinning down our direct involvement with running Mozilla Open Leaders, I did train a whole cohort of people on how to run their own mentorship programs. And a bunch of them are around today, so mostly in the life sciences. There's open life science, open scapes, and then environmental sciences, and a pre-review. I just wanted to shut them out because I'm really happy that they're still doing this. <laughs> So mentorship programs are a great way to build community and pass on a good idea on how to develop skills for other people. Now let's talk a little bit about the challenges. Um, how do you avoid uh, mentor burnout? Um, I would say, so for us, everything is like connected to this like surge of applications we get. We get like, uh, over 3,000 applicants for every round. We only have generally 50 to 70 interns per round. So it's like a huge influx of people and the mentors, it's so much for them to handle. And so, um, you know, generally, I think it's generally true of what, um, what folks are saying where um, the mentorship itself is very rewarding. And so the mentors keep coming back and, um, and within communities, um, mentors avoid burnout by taking turns mentoring in any particular round. Then we also have communities that kind of sit out for a round or two and then come right back in and then um, take a break. Some people will mentor opposite, um, do outreachy opposite Google Summer of Code so that it, they don't, you know, there's not too many people mentoring at any one time um, or they'll choose. Um, and I think for us, it's supporting the mentors during the application period. So we wind up um, uh, getting a lot of our, our former participants to come in and help support the new applicants. Otherwise, it's just the mentors get completely overwhelmed with applications. Did you want to um, so, uh, mental uh, burnout is also a big challenge for us. I don't know, I just want to share a bit. If you know the way how Asian people learn, it's all about like going to the class and listen to, to the teacher and follow what be what they are being told. And when we, we, we see the pattern that our participants in the program, they expect a lot from, from the mentors. For example, um, uh, if they submit a code, so before they test or review, they expect that the mentors 
tell them what exactly go wrong with my code, how, how can, can do, I do to change this, and they really follow strictly what the mentor says, and this is something uh, really hard for the mentors, especially for people who live in like another country, another continent, and the students or, or the contributor just expect the answer within like two hours or something after they pose a question. Um, so for us to avoid that, we make it very clear in our like guideline for the program, so this is not a tutoring program. So uh, you don't come here to get a tutor to teach you what you will do. So for us, it, it focuses a lot on cost contribution. For example, in order to participate in our program, people need to take the initiative to learn about the program before they can actually tackle an issues. And uh, we also published something called the Force Asia Developer um, Best Practice, where we show people, okay, if you want to look for uh, this um, uh, uh, resources where you can look into, and we mentioned several times, uh, on the onboarding call with everyone and also on our documentation that the mentors are there to support, not there to, to do your work and I need to be conscious about the volunteering time of, of the mentors. And another strategy is I think that's similar to a lot of organizations, um, we need more people. So if you have only one mentor to take care of 20 projects, so it's, it's difficult to avoid burnout. But if you have more people um, like from different time zones that are valuable is also help a bit. Yeah, so for me at GitHub, when I came into the role, I were working with all of these maintainers of big open source projects. They're already at capacity. They don't have time to sit and mentor others. So I really intentionally designed more peer mentorship spaces, so things like workshops and, and more casual places where people can dive in and just share their knowledge and sort of get that support from their peers and then jump out again. Um, and I, I'd like to Im implement more like uh, English is weird today. Yeah, I'd like to implement more structured mentorship, but it's there's no capacity for that. But then at Mozilla, when we did have like people mentoring, I did my best to, I'm, I'm a fan of time boxed roles. So it's nice how these, this program, it's only for three months. So you're only doing that for three months. We don't invite you to be a mentor and then you're just a mentor forever. You have to like reapply, not apply, you have to like accept it again, um, which is a little different from open source, where often you get asked to be a maintainer and you're just there forever. I'm a very crappy maintainer on several open source projects just because I'm too scared to quit. <laughs> um, so I just make it as easy as possible to quit. So at the end of that, and if I ever notice a mentor starting to slack or like miss a meeting or an, a mentee missing something, then I would go in immediately and just check like, hey, do you want to step back? We have extra mentors on standby. Do you need to take a break and just be as responsive as I can? And I found that really helped with maintainer burnout and just setting that, just make it easy as possible for people to step down. Um, yeah. Well, with Google Summer of Code, we have 1,200 plus participants each year, so I can't monitor that, but there's about 195 to 200 or so organizations. And so we have this concept of an organization administrator. And really one of their main roles is to make sure, one, the mentors are doing their evaluations and that they're paying attention to the mentors, and but also to really monitor them. Now, some orgs are better, org admins are better about that than others, but that is something that is really important because like everybody said, that mentor burnout, it can happen really quickly. And especially we noticed this a lot during 2020, 2021, both with the mentees and the mentors. So now it's interesting because you'll see people who have been mentors for 15, 16, 17 years. This year, for example, I have an organization who they've been mentoring for a long time. They did Google Code in with us, which was a very high, highly intensive mentoring program for high school students for about seven weeks. And so it was incredibly intense with tons of questions. You can ask <laughs> uh, Hong Fook about that. And so it was very intense and they did a great job. But this year, clearly they just didn't have the mentoring uh, bandwidth. And so they've dropped the ball on a few things and they're like, we just shouldn't have you know, accepted or we shouldn't have applied this year. And I'm like, it's okay. You don't have to apply every year. Kind of like um, they were saying, you can take a year off, take two years off, that's fine. And maybe you've outgrown the mentorship program. That's fine too. You know, if you don't need Google Summer Code or Outreach or any of our programs anymore, that's fine. But I think the burnout is definitely something that people usually don't see it in themselves. So you need somebody else in your community to be paying attention to help 
realize, you know what, I think this person has a lot on their plate. Let's see if we can jump in. And we do also encourage people to have more than one mentor. You usually are going to have one primary, and then you're going to have maybe two or three that are kind of backups, or maybe they're kind of handling one particular aspect of the project. That happens a lot. And that we're seeing that more and more. For many years, it was just kind of a one-on-one. -on -one, but now, sometimes there's even four or five mentors that are assigned to a project for different aspects. Um, thank you so much for, for that. So uh, looking at the, the impact the programs have uh, and how it's a win-win for mentors and mentees, and also I, I was in this other session before about the state of open source in Europe, where uh, one of the findings was that mentorship was key to, to advancing the open source sector. However, uh, this evidence doesn't always correlate with funding. And so my next question is, what is your strategy to secure funding for your program? Do you have any views on the current state of funding for programs like this? And are, are these programs more challenged now to get funding or has funding always been challenging? All right, I'm gonna start. Um, I know people think, oh, Google, Google has money. They'll just keep paying for Google Summer of Code. Um, you know, it is definitely challenging. Every year gets more challenging. Fortunately, we do have the support of our management and multiple lines up, which is great. But, you know, again, when budgets get cut and you are in particular organizations, you've got to justify why your why they should give you X millions of dollars, which is the case with Summer of Code. So <laughs> We've also done a lot of things over the years to try to streamline the program, even though we still want to have 1,200 plus participants, but things that we can do to make the money go further. And I think that's something that all of us are finding the need to do. So even though I do work at a large company, still you have to ask for money and you have to justify why this program is so important, why it's important to the open source community, why it's important to the company. So. Okay. <laughs> um, when uh, Outreach started fundamentally, and I guess it was 2010, um, you know, when it was a small GNOME only program, it was a little challenging to um, fundraise and it was new for each intern that we had, but we managed to get it done. And then as the program established itself, it became extremely easy to fundraise for. The money just came to us for a while because the program works so like has an, an an obvious visible impact. It really impacts the communities that have participated. Um, amazing people were coming in and, and, and are coming in. Um, and and what has happened recently is that the contraction and funding for both free and open source software generally and also for diversity initiatives has just struck us really, really, really hard. And the effect is is double because the communities that participate in Outreachy generally bring their own funding for their internships. And over the last few years, that has declined, and those communities have asked us to fund their interns more and more out of our general fund. While at the same time, the funding for diversity initiatives, which took a major jump in 2020, has started to be massively pulled back in the last two years. And so we announced um, just, a, I guess, a month or two, a month ago, that we're, um, we're having a major funding crisis and that um, many of our communities have come to us for funding. Um, uh, for perspective, one of our largest rounds, we had uh, 68 internships um, during that round. Um, we only funded about eight interns out of our general budget, and we always focused on communities that were um, uh, humanitarian or open science, um, but also brought brought money to communities that didn't have um, funding lined up, like the Linux kernel, or um, and so we 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 wound up funding those internships. Uh, but in that one, we only funded eight, and in this round, we only could afford thirty five interns, and we're getting thousands of applicants. And of those, we've funded uh, like almost 20 of them. So we're funding many more internships. It's very, very difficult. If you know of anyone who has access to funding, please let us know because we are going to have to dramatically reduce the program if we don't find funding soon. Okay. <laughs> And I think this is a, problem, a challenge that a lot of communities are having. And, uh, uh, and I should mention that uh, women, in, women who code shut down recently, um, girls in tech announced that they, they wound up shutting down because they couldn't raise $100,000. They said, if we don't raise $100,000, we're shutting down. And then they didn't raise it. So it's across the board, and you know it's so rough. 
Thank you for uh, for this for sharing these views. At this point, I want to open up to Q and A. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience. I saw a hand earlier. Okay. 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 Sorry, I was looking for it. <laughs> um, thank you very much. My name is Aldo Cantu. I'm uh, the program manager at OSPO in Airbus. Um, talking about the uh, kind of the exponential impact of mentorship. Uh, a little bit of a challenging question. Um, how do you assess the quality of mentorship? Because of course we're humans, we commit mistakes, we might give up misinformation or um, we might be opinionated in a way to do stuff. No? So how do you measure the quality? And if I might open up a second question, um, is there like a meta uh, guideline to train mentors? Um, I'm going to repeat the question on the mic. So how do you assess the quality of the mentorship? And is there uh, a meta guideline on, um, as, uh, on training mentors? All right. I'm going to address the second question first. So we actually have, uh, for Google Summer Code, we have what we call the mentor guide. So you can go to our, our site, look in the help section, and then look up guides. And there's a contributor guide and mentor guide. These really, they're technically based for Google Summer of Code, but 95% of it for both the contributors and the mentors are going to go across any open source organization and really any open source community or tech community. So I would suggest checking that out because there's all kinds of things in there that has we've added to. It's been written by organization administrators, former students, our Google program admins over the years. And it's funny, it was first written, I think, in 2010, and we've slowly updated bits and pieces over the years, but 90% of it still completely applies 14 years later. So it really is a great guide. Um, Sorry, the first question was... Uh, how do you assess the quality? Of uh, yeah, so again, we have 1,200 students, 2,000 plus mentors each year. So I don't do that um, other than... I do actually read all of the feedback, it takes time. Uh, have not, I've just barely started for this year, but reading the feedback from the contributors and you know, most of it's very positive, but then you see some that you're like, hmm, something's going on here. And it, when I notice that it's more than one particular or a particular organization, I go, okay, something's going on here. Or if I see two complaints, because maybe it's the same mentor that has two students. And so they're like, well, okay. And one of the things I tell people when they're talking about being a mentor, not everybody should be a mentor. I don't know that I would personally be a good mentor. You know, I think a lot of people want to be a mentor and that's great. But that doesn't mean you should be. And I think that's something that the communities, whether like for GSOC, it's the org admins, but whoever it is in your community needs to kind of be paying attention to that. Because we've had people who said, you know, this person was not a good mentor, but they're great as an organi organization administrator. They're great doing other things. They're great at answering questions on the chat channels, but they're not good with that one-on-one -on -one relationship. And so I think that's something, nobody likes to hear that, so you've got to be careful how you say that, but you know there's other skills that they bring to your community. So help them find those skills. Yeah. yeah, and I think with uh, Mozilla Open Leaders, we do have, um, we did have evaluations at the end where both the mentor and the mentee would fill out, so we get a little bit of data from that. But with the program generally, um, since I was optimizing for mentors, part of the selection process for even being a participant, some of that criteria was geared at would they be a good mentor in the future. So we really were trying to find people that were willing to learn from others that were um, like passionate about open source, ready to teach others about that. And I can't remember, oh yeah, and had like the extra time to do these things. So that helped with our like participant selection list so that by the time we're inviting them to become a mentor, it was like a finer pool. And then part of the, um, we were talking about maintainer burnout and mentor burnout before. Part of the way we addressed that was looking at that value exchange for being a mentor, like what makes it worth it to be here. So we did a lot of mentor training actually. So it was like a professional development for these people. So we'd teach them little different frameworks that you could use for mentorship, um, things like active listening. We had workshops for them so that it was like continuous learning for the mentors. So they still had value with coming back and mentoring others. Um, and like they get a role, they can put this on their LinkedIn, other things like that. Um, but it is tough to measure, yeah. 
Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said here. It's one of the reasons Outreachy has four feedback sessions over the course of the internships, and it is we are we we have many fewer internships, and I find it it's a challenge to read everything. Yes, I'm very impressed, Stephanie. Yeah, <laughs> to reading them all, and so we 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 read them all, and we also get feedback from our interns as well as our mentors, and uh, and making sure that we have that that feedback super early means that we can get involved early. Um, similarly, when we um, when a community wants to join Outreachy, we have a, um, a fairly intensive vetting process for each community, and we look at the communication on the various forums, and we check to see how are people talking to each other? Do we know who the mentors are going to be? Can we see how they're already talking to contributors and especially newcomers? We look, what are the newcomer questions look like in the community, and how are they addressed? Are, are people responsive? Are they not responsive? And we find that we can anticipate that in advance. Once a, a community already participates, then we aren't we don't do the same kind of vetting, but usually a lot of those questions come up early. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, and so uh, just to, to add a, a little bit, so um, yeah, so Google Summer Code have their mentor guideline. We also have one for, for Force Asia, so to share with our mentor. So basically, similar to what Stephanie said, we also have uh, something called do and don't in terms of communication style with the, with the contributors. So this is one part that we add on. And, and I think uh, mentorship is about volunteer volunteering, right? So when you talk about measuring mentorship, I don't know exactly measure because we are not in a corporate setting. We don't do like performance measurement for the mentors. So they volunteer their times. So some of the big like challenge that like we see just the way how they communicate with with the contributor communication style, and um, it's difficult to avoid like misunderstanding. So we try to do okay. This is something that you should not say or should communicate in, in a certain way. And to measure the program, I think we mentioned already before the the good mentorship program is also mean that an impactful outcome. So you have more contribution. You have more people keep coming to sign up. So that's all. Yes, uh, thank you so much. So I'm going to repeat the question on the mic. Um, how do you uh, keep an eye out to have a diverse pool of mentors um, when mentoring is a, 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 vol a, a volunteer uh, role? Um, uh, yeah, a diversity in terms of, uh, I think the implication is uh, race and gender, and also uh, mental, uh, how do you keep an eye out for mental health uh, of mentors? Harichi is a diversity initiative, and so for us, we um, had a, a founding principle of not burdening the diverse participants of our community with also having to mentor because it's an additional role and additional work. So, um, so increasing the diversity of our mentors has not been a major focus for us from early on, um, but it's something that we think about deeply, and um, we. Uh, I also want to say that a high percentage of the mentors in our community are working for companies where those companies allocate a portion of the person's job to also mentor, and we look for ways to um, to help those mentors demonstrate the value that they're bringing to their employment while also volunteering. But we also have a good number of mentors who are just volunteering because they think it's really important and they want to contribute their time. Um, I would say that we, we, before our funding crisis, we had been establishing a new program where we're going to fund diverse mentors. So folks that were also subject to systemic bias, who experienced discrimination, and who maybe wouldn't have the resources to get involved as, um, as mentors. And we're, we were sort of poised to launch that, but obviously we can't do that now. But I think that that could be really important to give people that, that extra 
step because it really is advantageous for people's careers and development to have that experience as a mentor. And similarly, it's much, it's a very effective mentorship program for folks that are subject to systemic bias and are part of marginalized groups generally to have diverse mentors. Yeah, thanks. And I think, um, I definitely agree with you, Marco. It, it is, it is limiting by like finding people who have the spare time to mentor. It's tricky. So um, what's been exciting for me to see as the programs have evolved, like Open Life Science, they actually pay their mentors, which is amazing because they saw this problem. They wanted to really uh, give back to the mentors. And I think the reason why I didn't answer the funding question before, like I'm not a fundraiser. I was, I definitely like run programs with whatever money I have, and it's often not that much. <laughs> and I would love to have paid mentors, um, but we didn't. But for diversity, for increasing diversity, diversity there. I think uh, enabling your community to to take what, to remix what you have uh, goes a long way. So actually Maria went through Open Leaders a while ago and um, she actually translated a lot of our stuff. She localized it in Spanish and she found people, projects to mention that were in Spanish. And it was great just seeing the community just take something and then just open it up to a whole new audience that I couldn't reach. And when we were like, um, spinning out open leaders into the community, I was really trying to focus on like different countries, different languages, like how can we run this so that it's not, because I'm not the best person to run like a Spanish language cohort. I would not understand what's going on. I know I look Spanish. People talk to me in Spanish all the time. <laughs> I do not understand the language. But like people from these communities are the best ones to reach those folks. But I agree, they're already so overburdened, like Karen was saying. So it's tricky to find that balance and we definitely need more funding in the space. Okay, just one final thought on that. Um, with Summer of Code, we actually do give the organizations what we used to call a mentor stipend. We now call it an org stipend because we give the money to the organization. Some of the organizations, so it's like $500 per student or per GSOC contributor. We don't call them students anymore. GSOC contributor. And some organizations do pass that $500 along to the mentors, but again, they've got to figure out how to do that, which paying people internationally is a nightmare. So, you know, <laughs> that is something to think about when you're doing your programs. It is very hard. Make sure you do a lot of research. But that is one of the things that, you know, most of the works actually don't get paid the mentors. So most of our mentors, so again, 2,200 plus mentors each year, most of them are volunteers. So to your point, yes, we definitely need more diversity. I think what is interesting is that I've seen is that reasons behind this, I don't know, but more of the, the women that have been involved in the program have gone on to become mentors, like the higher percentage of the women that have been in GSOC have gone on to become mentors themselves. I mean, a lot of the men have too, so I'm not saying, but percentage wise, when you're looking at the number of per, uh, women in GSOC versus the number that go on to become mentors and do it multiple years is higher. So that's an interesting little stat. So I think this is an important question. So I want to ask something here as well. Um, so one challenge to pay the mentors is you don't want to move away from the collaborative sharing culture into transactional culture. People do it to get pay. However, it's important to give your mentor recognition. So, so what we do is we recognize them on our website, um, uh, invite them to events, pay for their fly, pay for the communication so they can meet us um, at a certain location. And of course, send our thank you notes, send our small present and appreciation to show the mentor. We also use the funding that we get from TreeSoc to bring them to the events in, the, in their region or places that they want to go. So this is something we do to show our appreciation. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Victor Brown and I work with uh, Super Bloom Design and thank you all for your talk. Uh, my question is mostly around like diversity of the kind of projects and kind of contributions that they are. Uh, for GSOC, like, I would expect, I'm a designer, and honestly the only project or mentorship program that is open that allows for designers is outreach and just like a handful of it. Um, but I also lead the open source design Africa chapter. We have a bunch of designers that are ready to contribute to open source, but there are no projects that are like really like, open to accept them. But we think that the mentorship program can do stuff like that. Is that something you've considered? And if you have, are there challenges that has made this apart from funding? Because I think that's the problem. <laughs> but like, what are the other things that you've also considered that have made this? 
this is something we get asked. Yes, um, I get asked this. Repeat the question. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, no, do it. <laughs> okay, so the question is about uh, have you considered the diversity of skills for a Google Summer, especially design for Google Summer of Code, which is a very common question. Yes, so we get asked that. We also get asked, um, what about documentation? Or will you pay us to do documentation? There's a program called Season of Docs, but that's not for beginners. That's for actual technical writers, but check that out. I'll be talking about that. Well, actually, not here. But anyway. Um, Tell them where, that, where your talk is. Oh, my talk is... Where, what floor are we on? Are we zero. zero. Upstairs, I actually need to leave because it's in nine minutes. But um, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, with um, the design, we thought about it, but we do kind of like Karen, we have tons of applications. We have over this year, I think was 6,500 applications for GSOC for coding projects. And it's just, it's Google Summer of Code. That's not to say that doing something like Google Summer of Design is not going to happen, but as we've talked about funding right now, that's not likely to happen anytime soon. But it is something that is important. Uh, the running joke is that you know all these open source projects, they're doing all these cool things, but their websites look terrible. Um, and it's pretty accurate most of the time. So they need designers. They need help. So yes, we understand the problem. Uh, it's not something, again, that's in the foreseeable future right now for GSOC, but that's why I also do point people to Outreachy, um, because that is one of the really cool things about Outreachy. They have so many different types of projects that people can participate in. Thank you so much, and thank you all for, for coming here and for bringing your, your questions as well. I think, uh, Steph, do you want to uh, mention your session? It's also about mentorship, right? Yeah, it's on mentorship programs, and I actually am going to be talking about Outreachy and the Linux Foundation mentorship programs and talking about GSOC and just kind of, it's more for one, uh, kind of the open source 101 track. So for people who are looking for a mentorship program, why would they want to participate? Some of the things that you're going to get out of it. And yeah, so it is on the first floor. Um, 6162. Look me here. Thank you. And I got to run up there. All right. <laughs> if you're starting a mentorship program, ask us for our documentation. We want to help you. Yeah.